Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Genetic Testing in CDLS. My name is Whitney Rinaldi. I am a Family Service Coordinator here at the Foundation, and I'm so excited to be hosting our first session in our 2019 webinar series hosted by the Foundation. Before I introduce our speakers, we would love to see where you guys are joining us from. If you look at the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a questions tab. Please send the state that you're joining us from, as well as if there's a person with CDLS in your life, what's their age? While you send in your answers, I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers, Sarah Rabel, genetic counselor and clinic coordinator at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and Elena Egans, pediatric and adult genetic counselor at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Both Sarah and Elena are members of our clinical advisory board. Before I hand the mic over to Sarah and Elena, you'll see a question pop up on your screen. Um, and I would love for you to answer that question of, has the person with CDLS in your life undergone genetic testing? I'll give you a couple of moments to send in your answers while I address a few housekeeping items for today's session. First of all, Today's webinar will be recorded and made available after the live session on the CDLS website, all the way at the bottom under the resource tab. Also, Sarah and Elena will present their presentation and we will hold a question and answer session at the end. We'd love for, to hear from you during today's session. So please, if you have questions for our speakers, send them in the question tab at the right of your screen. My colleague and fellow Family Service Coordinator, Lynn, will be manning the question box throughout today's webinar. And Sarah and Elena will be answering those questions at the end of the session. Unfortunately, due to um, time constraints, we may not be able to answer all questions that are submitted. So please, we encourage you to submit those questions if not answered through the Ask the Expert form on our website. And we will follow up with you and make sure those questions get answered. Um, before we begin, let's close this poll and see the results. So 48% said yes, you've had genetic testing and 35% said no. So before we begin, I can see, oops, sorry. So now that we have seen the poll, we'll close the poll and I will pass on everything over to Sarah and Elena. So welcome ladies, we're so happy to have you. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar about genetic testing. Today we are going to be going through some general information about what is genetic testing, talk a little bit about the types of genetic testing that is available in 2019, including testing that is for individuals after birth for children and adults, talk a little bit about prenatal testing options and touch on research. We will also spend a lot of time looking through what the genetic test reports look like and also what do those mean, and then talk a little bit about the benefits and limitations of genetic testing. So to start off, just a touch base about genetics kind of overall. Um, when we think about our genetics, so our bodies are made up of thousands of cells, and in each of these cells, contains all of our genetic information. That genetic information is our body's instruction manual, um, which tells us how to grow, how to function and develop. Um, and this instruction is written as DNA. Um, this DNA through multiple processes are turned into proteins and proteins are then what do the functions of all of our bodies to make our body work correctly. Our genetic information is housed on chromosomes. So a typical individual has 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46 in almost every cell of the body. The first 22 chromosomes, so numbered one through 22, are the same for individuals whether one is male or female. The last group of chromosomes called the sex chromosomes are different depending on if one is male or female. Uh, males have an X and a Y, and females have two X's. Almost all of our genes are then packaged onto these chromosomes. <laughs> 
So as we take a look a little bit further into the chromosomes, you can see this image here, the red and the green. So chromosomes have two arms. There's the small arm, or P, standing for petite, and then there's the larger arm, Q, just next letter in the alphabet, um, the Q arm. Those two arms, or sections, are connected by what we call a centromere in the middle. So that everyone can communicate about chromosomes in the same way, the chromosomes are labeled based on which arm of interest we're looking at, the P or the Q, and then also based on a specific banding pattern. So as you can see here on the right, each chromosome has a different banding pattern um, that, that you can see between the white and the black bands. Each band is given a specific number. Um, and so when we're looking at a specific section, we can make this distinction based on example, this one here. So chromosome two on arm P, and then the band we're looking at specifically is 24.1. Two, um, and that would correlate to the band over here that the green arrow is pointing at. So when we think about our chromosomes, we can sometimes have too much or too little information. Um, so a common condition you may have heard about is trisomy 21, which is Down syndrome. And in this, in, these individuals have an extra copy of their chromosome 21, as you can see here on um, the image having just an extra copy. Um, this is of a different chromosome, but it's showing an extra. Um, you can also have extra sections or just an extra piece called a duplication. You can also have too few chromosomes, so having a missing section or piece of chromosome, which is called a deletion. Um, so for example, there's some individuals that have CDLS due to a deletion on chromosome five, which actually includes a CDLS gene. And so by missing this gene, it leads to the symptoms of CDLS. Um, an individual may also have chromosome differences called a translocation. This is when pieces of the chromosome switch places. So if the pieces switch places but no information is gained or lost, it's called a balanced translocation. And if pieces switch places but there is a gain or a loss of some of the chromosome material, it's caused, called an unbalanced translocation. We have about 20 to 25,000 genes in our human genome, with most of these being packaged, again, on those chromosomes we talked about. About 5% of the genome is, in, includes genes that we're, we know what they do, so known genes. But that means that the function of majority of the genome is still unknown, with research ongoing to, to try and learn more about those areas. Along those genes, though, we can have mistakes that happen, and these are called mutations or variants. These can be in forms of deletions or duplications, so extra missing small pieces. There can be expansions of particular areas, or there can be a single letter change called a point mutation that we'll talk a little bit more about later. So now that Elena has discussed a bit about our chromosomes and our genes and how they function in our bodies and the different roles that they have, I'm going to talk about how CDLS can occur. So CDLS is considered an autosomal dominant condition. And what that means is that when Elena was discussing about our genes and our chromosomes, since we have two copies of every single gene, since we get one from our mom and one from our dad, you only need to have a genetic change in one copy of the gene in order for that to cause CDLS. There are some other types of genetic diagnoses where you need to have both copies affected, but that's not the case for CDLS. Just having one gene with a change is enough to present with signs and symptoms. And even though CDLS is considered a genetic diagnosis, it's not genetic in, this, in, our, in the typical sense that we think about genetics being passed down from one individual to another or occurring in different or multiple members of a family across generations. And this is because it's a genetic change that majority of the time is something that occurs spontaneously in a child. It's a new change that randomly occurs and it's not something that we typically see being passed down from generation to generation. We all have different genetic changes in our genes. It's just part of our natural biology and what makes us different. Why someone may have blue eyes versus brown eyes and it just so happens that there may have 
been a change occurring in a gene that's very critical for development and learning and is related to causing CDLS. These new changes are a lot of times referred to as a de novo change. So if you have had a medical provider refer to it, to the change as being de novo, or if you see that on a genetics result report, that's what that is referring to. And you can see in this picture representation here on your slide that this is depicting an autosomal dominant type of inheritance. So we see in this picture, both mom and dad are considered unaffected. They're shaded in gray. And with every pregnancy, there is not an increased risk to have a child with CDLS. It's just something that spontaneously randomly occurred in one of their children. And this genetic change is something that can occur in any of the known CDLS genes. If it occurs on one of the genes that's within chromosomes one through 22, it's considered autosomal dominant. And if it occurs on a gene that's located on that X chromosome, it would be considered X-linked. So with CDLS, there are sometimes we see multiple individuals in a family who have CDLS, even though majority of the time in 99% of cases, it's a new change. And there are two reasons for why we can see families that have multiple children with CDLS. The first reason would be due to a parent being affected or mildly affected. And if that's the case with each pregnancy, there would be a 50% chance for an individual who has CDLS to pass on that genetic change to their children. And in this picture here, we have a representation of dad having CDLS because he's shaded in purple. And you can see there's half of their children have a diagnosis of CDLX, CDLS. The other way in which you can have multiple children with CDLS is through something called germline mosaicism. And again, these two types of occurrences are very rare. They happen in less than 1% of families that we see. And that has to do with having the genetic change in a subset of either the dad's sperm or in a subset of the mom's eggs. Now, if that change is in dad's sperm or mom's eggs, we wouldn't see that they would be having any signs or symptoms of CDLS, they would be considered unaffected. Um, but this is something that we can't really test for because we can't test for all of dad's sperm, we can't test all of mom's eggs, but if two parents who do not have CDLS have two or more children with CDLS, we think it's due to that type of phenomenon called germline mosaicism. So as I mentioned before, and as Elena had spoken about, that there are some genes, in particular two genes, that are associated with CDLS that do exist on the X chromosome. So this has a little bit of different implication for families and for occurrence in a family. So in this picture here on the, on the side on the left, you can see in this scenario, we have dad who has a change on an X-linked gene and mom who's unaffected. So with the father, since he would have to pass on his X chromosome to all of his daughters, because that's the only way this couple would have a daughter is if they get the X from dad and then mom would pass along one of her X's. We see here in this picture representation that all of the daughters would then have CDLS because they would have to inherit that genetic change from dad in order to be a girl. Now on the other side of this picture, on the right hand side, we have the representation here of showing mom having a change in one of those genes that's on the X chromosome. So for mom, she's either going to pass on the copy of her X chromosome that has the genetic change or the copy that does not. So for her, there would be a 50-50 chance with each pregnancy that they would have, this couple would have a child with CDLS and it doesn't really matter depending on the sex of the baby, whether it's male or female. So that's the difference with X-linked. And with X-linked in particular, we 
do know that there's something called X inactivation. So since women have two X chromosomes, we really truly only need one to function. So as women, one X chromosome is shut off in every cell of the body. So depending on the number of X chromosomes that have the genetic change that are shut off versus the ones that are not, that can have an impact on how significantly or severely affected an individual may be who has CDLS. This is specific for one gene that's called HDAC8. There is another gene called SMC1A that also is on the X chromosome, but SMC1A is believed to be a little bit different where it does not follow that rule and it escapes X inactivation. So the SMC1A gene is expressed on both copies of the X chromosome, even though one copy of the X is shut off. So there also is something called a mosaic mutation. And I know we talked about germline mosaicism, but you can be mosaic for a CDLS genetic change in all of the cells of your body. So this may sometimes be the scenario if your child has had genetic testing in their blood and all testing has come back negative. The next step would be to test for something called mosaicism. And mosaicism refers to having a genetic change in some cells of your body, but not all of them. So it's kind of like a mosaic tile. And you can see in this picture representation here that somewhere along the way, a genetic change occurred in one of the cells as the baby was developing. And you can see that's depicted by this cell here that's green that has the genetic change. And as the baby continues to grow and the cells continue to multiply and divide, you can see that there's some collection of cells that are green with the genetic change and others that are this yellow orange, which are considered typical cells. And the symptoms that we see can be hard to predict because we don't really know and don't have a way of testing how many cells in the brain versus heart and other organ systems have this genetic change. So we know quite a few genes that can cause CDLS. There are five main genes which are considered to cause typical or more of a classic CDLS-like presentation when a change occurs in these genes. The most common is NIPBL, and we see out of children and individuals who have CDLS, about 60% of individuals have CDLS due to a genetic change in this NIPBL gene. There are four other genes listed here, which occur in less than 5% of the CDLS com community, and those are SMC1A, HDAC8, those two X-linked genes that we talked about, SMC3, and RAD21. More recently, over the last few years, we have been discovering additional genes, which are listed on the bottom of your slide here, BRD4, KMT2A, AFF4, AnchorD11, TAF1 and 6, and there are others as well, which we're finding individuals ha have changes in these genes and present with a CDLS-like type of presentation or symptoms, but aren't considered truly or classic CDLS. So with this, there is a lot of different testing options to you, especially as our understanding of the genetics has changed over time and we've been finding more and more genes. So there are different options, and the first would be testing for one gene at a time, which would be single gene testing. And for many children where a diagnosis of CDLS is highly suspected, sometimes testing is done just on NIPBL first, because this is the most common gene and there may be the highest likelihood to find a change in this gene. So if a change is found in NIPBL, then that would be the answer and there's not really a need for any further testing. If there is not a change found in NIPBL, sometimes individuals may have panel testing where testing would be done for multiple genes, so two or more genes. And there are quite a few different panels that have been developed by different labs. There are some panels that just focus on those five main typical CDLS genes, but there are other panels that are more broad that 
have been including more of those other atypical like CDLS genes. So it really depends on your child's presentation and what your geneticists and medical providers feel would be best to order. Testing can also be done even beyond just the CDLS genes. So there's something that's called exome sequencing where this sequences all of our genes. We have 20,000 genes in our body. And with exome sequencing, this is a little bit different from targeted gene testing. Since this looks at everything, um, there sometimes can be the possibility to find changes that we aren't expecting. However, exome sequencing is really most beneficial for children and individuals where CDLS may be suspected, but it's not quite clear or there's not um, a lot of confidence that CDLS is definitely going to be the correct diagnosis. And this just explains exome in a little bit more detail. So again, this is a really good test for individuals where it's not clear what the diagnosis may be, because this is a way to really cast the widest net possible to look at almost everything. And this is also a good test for individuals who've had a lot of specific genetic testing for the known CDLS genes, but everything has come back negative and there still is not an underlying genetic answer for your child's symptoms. And thinking about our genes with exome, how it works in the material that we're looking at, is that we have exons and introns that make up our genes. And the exonic material is really the functional material of our genes. The introns are more kind of housekeeping regulatory elements. So the exons are what are kind of spliced out and that's what is looked at for this testing, which is why it's called exome analysis. There are three different sample types that testing can be done on. The first would be blood, which is most traditionally used. The second would be saliva, and there's also cheek swabs. Now, all three of these are great uh, resources that can be used to do genetic testing on. One is not really better than the other. We can collect DNA from all of these. However, blood is typically preferred because with saliva and cheek swabs, it can be hard to get enough quantity of DNA and the quality is not as good as what you get from blood. And sometimes for those of you who may have had testing for mosaicism, typically a cheek swab would be preferred at that point because mosaicism can be hard to pick up in the blood. So if blood is tested and that's negative, the best next step would be to test a different tissue type, the easiest of which would be to collect a skin sample and that can easily be done by doing a cheek swab. So our next section is going to be to talk a little bit more about the possible interpretation of genetic testing results. So the three categories that we think about when we get test results back are positive, negative, and variant of uncertain significance. So a positive change is, as you would expect, this indicates that a genetic change is found and that that change is associated with the condition CDLS. A negative test report means that in whatever number of genes were evaluated, no genetic change was identified in those genes that's associated with CDLS. Now a negative report, it's important to note, does not mean that there is not a genetic change in that individual's genes. It just means that the current testing that was sent was not able to identify that genetic testing. And it's possible that the current testing in 2019 or the most recent testing when it was sent was not able to identify this um, the genetic change. And lastly, there's a variant of uncertain significance. This indicates that there was a genetic change that was identified, um, but it's unclear. There's just not enough evidence at the time of the testing to know if that variant is just normal variation, so kind of the normal human variation we see between person to person, um, or if that change actually does affect how the gene works and then leads to a non-functional gene.
So just some examples of what it might look like to get these different types of results. Um, so this is an example of a positive test result. Um, you can see on the, around the middle of the report, it states what the testing was looking. So this was that single gene test that Sarah mentioned for just NIPBL. And in this case, for this individual, a positive result was found. You can see the other term that sometimes is used in that middle section um, under result is called pathogenic or disease causing. Um, and that the interpretation is that this genetic change is likely the answer and explanation for the individual's symptoms and features of CDLS. This is an example of a negative test report um, in which you can see in the middle that there was a panel sent, so more than one gene was submitted or was evaluated. And in that panel, no genetic changes were identified. Um, so again, it does not rule out a genetic cause for that individual's symptoms. It just means that it wasn't able to be identified on this testing. And then thirdly, just an example of an inconclusive or a variant of uncertain significance. Again, you can see in the middle, the test that was sent was a sequencing and deletion duplication panel. Um, and then at the bottom, you can note there that there are summaries that this was an inconclusive result, that there was a genetic change found, but it's still unclear at this point as to whether or not that change is benign variation or something that's affecting how the gene works. So what do we do with these variant of uncertain significances? Um, so for these variants, there's a couple things. First, um, that to know that the interpretation of the variant can change over time if we learn new information. So some examples of things we may learn that would help us further clarify um, what direction benign or, or positive they, those would be um, is if another individual was also identified to have the same change in the gene um, and that individual also has CDLS. Um, additionally, if there's a study, for example, that might look at this specific change in mice and if in mice it leads to the symptoms of CDLS ALS, those, these are both pieces of evidence that would suggest this variant is the cause. Sometimes when we have a BUS, though, we can continue and look at other additional genes if they've not already been evaluated for CDLS um, to see if anything else can be identified. So as we start to talk about the implications of various results, it's also important to have a little background in kind of what these letters mean on the report. Um, so typically we see two ways to describe our genetic changes. There's the C position or the C dot and the P dot. So the C is describing the genetic position along the gene sequence. Um, and if we think about our genes as being made up of their own alphabet of letters A's, T's, C's, and G's, all these letters are um, associated with specific molecules called nucleotides. And these nucleotides are lined up in a specific way. Um, and what the C dot is telling us is that at a particular position, so in this case at position one, three, four, five, there was supposed to be an A and instead there's a G. So the next step in how this impacts interpretation is that that letter change then impacts what uh, protein is produced produced. So we kind of take a step back and just remembering that DNA provides the instructions for our proteins and there's it's done do, does this in a language of three. So each three DNA letters are equivalent to a single we call amino acid which is a protein building block and then all together all these amino acids are put together into a single protein. Um, and so if we have a letter change, then that's going to impact that three letter word that codes for an amino acid. And therefore the amino acid can be affected and changed, which can change the protein. So in this case, you can see that what was supposed to be there is um, phenylalanine and it was replaced by a tyrosine. And each of the amino acids have their own either three letter or one letter. So the PHE and TYR are just three letter codes for the different types of amino acids. So depending on the type and the location of the genetic change, it can cause different types of changes. Um, and you might see these types of words on a test report or in conversation. Um, so if we think of our genes as a page out of an encyclopedia, and then 
the words or mutations are, are like a misspelled word, we can look at the different types. So there's something called a missense mutation in which either one letter or a word is changed. And you can see the impact is that the sentence either doesn't make sense or now forms nonsensical words. Another type is where you have an extra thing inserted. So you have an insertion mutation where one word or letter is inserted. And again, that can impact the readability of the sentence or even the ability to make true words. A nonsense mutation is where the instructions stop too soon. So the sentence stops before it can be fully read through. And a deletion mutation is when you have either a letter or a word that's removed or missing, which again can make the sentence no longer make sense with the gene, um, or the um, words no longer make any sense either. And so both of these can lead to a gene that's not working. So we already, this is just written out a different way of the missense, the nonsense, and this, the frame shift or those insertion deletion types of changes. Um, and then the other type is something called a splice site. Um, and this is just where there's a change in the part of the gene that affects how the gene is processed into instructions by the protein, um, where the different pieces are, are kind of cut out and put together. Um, that instruction can't be fully read and so the protein cannot be made correctly. A few other words you might see um, in just terms of terminology. So um, there is a term called heterozygous, and that just means that there's only a genetic change found on one of the two copies of the gene that we have. When we think about those genes on the X chromosome, because males only have one copy of the X chromosome, they only have one of those copies of the gene at all. And so that is called a hemizygous, so when that change is found on the X chromosome in a male. Since they only have the one, it's hemi versus heterozygous. And then lastly, if an exome was performed, there may also be notation of if a variant was found uh, in the mother, maternal, or father, paternal, as well as the individual being tested. And one of the common questions that were asked is about specific genes or specific mutations and what that means for a child's symptoms. And there is certainly a lot of overlap. We don't have a full understanding of the differences between the genes, but there are certainly some things that we commonly do observe, but we're continuing to learn as we do more and more testing. And this type of correlation between a set of symptoms and a specific gene and gene mutation is something that we refer to as a genotype-phenotype correlation. And what that means is that genotype is just referring to the gene and the specific genetic change or mutation in that gene. And phenotype is referring to the presence, absence, or severity of a set of symptoms. And in this image here, we're trying to depict a lot of this variability and overlap that can be seen with the different genes. And we have these sections of mild, moderate, and severe in the middle. And on the outside, we have different genes and different types of mutations in the genes listed. And as you can see, some of the genes and types of mutations occur multiple times in the mild, moderate, and severe categories. So we'll go through each of the five main genes first and discuss a little bit about these similarities and differences between them. So for NIPBL, this again is the most common gene that we see and children or individuals who have changes in NIPBL typically have characteristic facial, the characteristic facial features that we see in CDLS. It's also more common for children to have structural differences, and that's referring to heart defects, limb differences, or kidney differences. However, the severity really depends on the type of mutation. Um, we do tend to find that any individual who has a limb difference will typically have a change in the NIPBL gene. 
However, we do see children who do not have structural differences and have more mild involvement, but still have a change in NIPBL. And again, this is getting back to the specific type of mutation. So it depends where in the gene the mutation falls. So if it's at the beginning of the gene versus at the end of the gene. And the specific type of mutation, as Elena had just gone through, whether it may be a missense mutation or more of a truncating mutation. And we have this image here on the right side of your screen where it shows at the bottom some more of those significant mutations, things that are truncating and truly blocking all of the protein production, more likely result in more of an involved or more of a severe type of presentation. Whereas those that are missense, where you're still making some of the protein, can pre tend to present more mildly. So moving on to RAD21, um, this gene that we uh, tend to see not as many structural differences in those who have RAD21 changes. There's still cognitive impairment and learning disabilities, though it can be more mild. We also see some other of the overlapping typical features of CDLS with facial features. There can be some minor skeletal differences and the children are still small in size. And with HDAC8, there are, again, this is one of those excellent genes, there are some differences compared to typical CDLS facial features. There is also something that we commonly see being reported in those who have HDAC8 mutations, and this is a delayed closure of a child's anterior fontanelle. So that's the soft spot on top of the baby's head, which typically closes around a year, but we found time and time again that parents have reported that that did not close at the typical time it was expected to and just closed later. There sometimes can be some varying pat uh, patterns in skin pigmentation. Again, we think it's due to that X inactivation where some Xs are shutting off and others are being expressed. Children still are small in size, but not as significantly impacted, perhaps compared to those who have more of a classic NIPBL type of change. They're still smaller in head size, but again, it's not seen as frequently. And as we had talked about before, the severity and the impact can really be altered based on the pattern of X inactivation. And then lastly, for SMC1A and SMC3, we tend to see fewer structural differences. Again, those organ differences, so differences of the heart development and limb, for example. Again, children are small in size, but may have a less significant impact on growth. There's still learning difficulties. And then for SMC1A in particular, I just wanted to mention this difference between the types of mutations. So with SMC1A, typically individuals who have a missense mutation in SMC1A will present with this CDLS-like or CDLS diagnosis. Those who have a truncating mutation in SMC1A do not have CDLS, they have a very different set of symptoms and a very different phenotype. Those individuals have very significant seizures, which can be hard to manage, and also have significant intellectual disability. So this is not CDLS, it's something that's been more recently seen over the last few years that has been reported. And then just to explain a little bit about our figure representation on the right side of your slide, again, this is just what we have some generalities about what we correlate with our phenotype or genotype phenotype correlations, where we have in general, those with changes in NIPBL tend to be more involved. And then as you kind of go up the top of this triangle, having a change in each of these genes, overall, we tend to see more of a mild involvement. But this is not a complete hard and fast rule. There is certainly a lot of variability, as we can see with many different genetic diagnoses, not just with CDLS in particular. Okay. So to talk about why testing and what really are some of the benefits. So we think that one of the benefits would be to confirm a diagnosis. And this, we think, can have a lot of benefits psychologically, especially if there is a question about whether or not CDLS truly is the correct diagnosis. The other reason that 
testing can be helpful for families is to give better guidance in terms of recurrence risk. And as we talked about earlier, depending on whether this is due to a change on a gene on the X chromosome versus on a different chromosome, and whether mom is carrying it can really change the recurrence risk for future pregnancies. So just to have some better guidance moving forward, what the risk could be if you wanted to expand your family. You also then would have the option to do prenatal diagnosis, and that's something that's offered to families who have a known genetic change already in their family. And we'll talk about that a little bit more about those options on the next few slides. Another type of benefit would be for therapeutics. There is not a current known therapeutic available for CDLS, but we think in the future and depending on future studies, if we find that there may be a specific type of therapy that works better for children with a specific type of genetic change compared to others, this could be helpful for management. And even down the road, as there may be uh, more developments into therapies and as what we're finding with other genetic diagnoses that do have clinical trials available or therapies available, it's really specific and dependent on the underlying genetic etiology. So knowing your child's underlying genetic change could be important for that moving forward if something did become available in future years. Another benefit is through research opportunities. And we learn a lot from all of you. That's how we better understand CDLS. And we thank you for your willingness to participate in research to allow us to better know about the diagnosis and to help give you better guidance. And this, just this example of having those different changes in SNC1A that we've found over the last few years is an example of what we've been able to learn from research and expanding this kind of genotype-phenotype correlation. And then lastly, a benefit of testing would be an impact on medical management. I know sometimes families who have a child who has a clinical diagnosis, knowing the genetic change that caused that may not really change medical management. And I know a lot of times that's the reason why insurance companies may not cover testing is because if a child already has a clinical diagnosis, they still will be followed as having CDLS and will be managed appropriately. But if there is a question in terms of whether or not CDLS is the correct diagnosis or if it could be something else, having the proper medical management can be very important moving forward to optimize a child's outcome. So we know that our testing is not perfect and there certainly are some limitations. And with that, our testing is not always 100%. There are certainly things that can be missed and there are maybe other genes out there that are causing C CDLS or CDLS-like presentations that we just have not discovered yet. Another limitation of testing are these variants of unknown significance, which Alina had talked about. And variants of unknown significance, or VUSs for short, can be very difficult to deal with. It can leave families with a lot of uncertainty, even more so than before doing the testing. Also, cost of the testing, it can be very expensive. And as I said before, insurance companies may not always be willing to cover it. Lastly, getting a sample can sometimes be difficult, especially in young babies who are small in size and have small veins. It can be really hard to collect a blood sample. So in terms of prenatal genetic testing, again, there this is the type of testing that would be offered to you. Traditionally, if you've already had a child with CDLS and you know the underlying genetic cause, Prenatal testing is typically done for that specific genetic variant, and it can be done through a CBS, which stands for chorionic villus sampling, or an amniocentesis. And this is done during a pregnancy, and it's done at different times during a pregnancy. And this testing, if you have a chorionic villus sampling, it's a um, or an amniocentesis, these are both considered invasive tests where a needle is stuck into mom's belly to collect a sample. 
Sometimes testing can be done on a panel where multiple genes are screened, and that's usually done in the scenario when mom is pregnant and there have been multiple findings on ultrasound that are pretty suggestive of CDLS diagnosis, and that may be if there's a limb difference, sometimes depending on the facial profile, other uh, structural differences like a heart difference that are suspecting someone to think about CDLS. Sometimes a CDLS panel may be done in that situation. There is another type of testing that's been more recently developed over the last few years called NIPT. It's non-invasive prenatal genetic testing. And this is a test that's done just using mom's blood because what we found is that some of the baby's genetic material is actually circulating in mom's blood during the pregnancy. And after the mom delivers, the baby's DNA is cleared from mom we think that the baby's DNA is fr coming from the placenta and its origin is from the placenta. And there are labs that can just test mom's blood sample and are able to determine baby's DNA versus mom's DNA and to look to see if there is a specific genetic change that is believed to be in the baby. As far as we know, there is one lab, Natera Lab, that's offering NIPT testing for CDLS. It's this Vistera test, which is a 30 gene panel that includes the five known CDLS genes or the five main CDLS genes. The only caveat with this testing is that if mom has CDLS and is carrying a CDLS genetic change, she would not be available, she would not be able to have this specific testing done because the lab could not differentiate between mom's genetic change and if the baby was carrying the genetic change. So lastly, there's another type of testing that we wanted to review, which is research testing. And this is something that may be a good option for families if it's there's not the ability to get genetic testing covered by their insurance, as sometimes the testing may be covered by a research laboratory. There is, however, quite a few important distinguishing factors between a research laboratory and a clinical laboratory that would typically do the clinical testing. Research labs have fewer requirements and have a different set of standards as opposed to clinical labs. So if you do find a result from a research lab, you will have to have it confirmed in a clinical lab in order to have the result included in your child's medical chart and to use it for any type of medical decision making or medical management moving forward. One thing that's really important to ask when enrolling in a research study is the kind of results that you would get back and if you will be getting results back. Not every single research lab does give results back to families. If they do give results back, the types of results will likely be similar to what you would get from your clinical testing, where you can get a positive result, a negative result, or one of those variants of unknown significance. Again, if your main motivation for enrolling in genetic research testing is to get a result back, this, we always encourage families to try and get the clinical testing done because unfortunately with research testing, it's largely dependent on grant funding. So it's not always guaranteed that your child's sample would be tested or how long it may take to get them tested. So that's something certainly to ask upfront if that's something that's important for you. So we just want to thank everyone for joining our webinar. This concludes our portion of our presentation. And now we will transition to the question and answer portion of the webinar. Thank you, this is Lynn. We have just a handful of questions, but I just wanted to remind folks that perhaps signed off uh, signed on a little bit later and missed the instructions of how to pose a question, that if you look to the right, you should see a gray 
um, bar that says questions and you can type in your questions from there. But let me start with who already submitted their questions. Uh, Sarah, what are the benefits of genetic testing of a 17-year-old with limb differences that has a clinical diagnosis of CDLS? That's a great question. So we do get that a lot because we know that the genes for CDLS actually weren't discovered until more recently. The first gene was discovered in 2004. So many families and many individuals who have CDLS were given, who were given a diagnosis before that date did not have genetic testing. Um, we do find that most individuals who have limb differences have a change in NIPVL, so it would be most likely that that may be the cause for your child's diagnosis of CDLS. But still having testing even at this point, I think can give some confirmation to a diagnosis and can also give you an underlying answer and an explanation. If there are certain treatments or therapies that become available later down the road, we think it's going to be very specific to the type of child's genetic change. So it would be important to know if something did become available in the future. If your child has CDLS due to NIPBL or a different gene, because again, I think you're a uh, the availability to enroll in any kind of study may be largely dependent on the genetic change. Thank you. Elena, can you talk about a few instances where there is no gene mutation found? Yeah, so like Sarah had talked a, a little bit, we know some of the genes associated with CDLS, but we don't know all of them. Um, and so if there's a situation where an individual has a clinical diagnosis and it is due to a gene that we just haven't figured out what that is yet, then if we do clinical testing for the current panel of all known associations, it would come back negative. And again, that doesn't mean that their actual genetic cause isn't present. It just, we weren't we don't know where to look just yet because we don't know all of the genes, and so it would be negative. Um, the other instance is if an individual has uh, CDLS due to a mosaic mutation. Um, so like Sarah said, mosaicism is sometimes hard to find in a blood sample. And so if someone does blood testing, um, which is the first, typically the first step um, is testing in a blood sample, and that comes back negative, it is possible it's because someone has the mosaic mutation, meaning that change is not in every cell in the body. And so if it's not in the cells, in the, the blood sample that was taken, it's going to come back and appear negative, even though that genetic change does exist elsewhere. And so one option to address that is to do uh, testing for mosaicism by looking at another type of tissue, like a cheek cell or a skin biopsy. Thank you. Sarah, would a blood transfusion impact the identification of a genetic change? So that's a good question. So it should it should not, but that's something that we definitely would want to know about if you were having testing done because it depends on how long ago that was done. Um, so it's something just to make sure if you were having testing done, just to let your providers know that that's part of their history. Thank you. Um, another question, when do you recommend to get a test for mosaicism? So we would recommend mosaicism testing after you've already had the typical clinical testing um, because if we are able to find the answer on the testing of, test of all of the known genes in blood and perhaps it isn't mosaic, um, we can find it on doing a, a general blood test for the known genes. Um, so only when that is negative would there be a benefit to, to thinking about most testing for mosaicism as an option um, as kind of a next step because of that initial negative test result. Sarah, have you come across any children with both CDLS and, and they specify SMC1A and I'm sorry I can't pronounce the other syndrome but the acronym is M1 or MIHV. Is there a connection? Our daughter has both diagnoses. So there sometimes can be individuals and children who have dual diagnoses or two diagnoses. It is 
very rare, um, but it certainly can happen. Uh, there, just because a child has a change in one specific gene that causes CDLS, it doesn't mean that there may be another genetic change somewhere else. Um, we have seen a few individuals who have CDLS and another diagnosis. It's very, very uncommon, um, but it can it can certainly happen. And there are families where they have a child who has CDLS and then they have another child who has another diag another genetic diagnosis, something like Down syndrome or something along those lines. Um, so it, it can be seen, um, but it, again, it's not common. Uh, Elena, is the University of Chicago still the largest or major genetic testing laboratory site for consideration? So there's a few other labs now that have uh, the larger panels for CDLS, um, and each laboratory has kind of a difference of um, if they're just doing clinical testing, some laboratories are able to do both clinical and both research, um, and so there are definite options, and usually the selection of the laboratory would be based on what is the exact test you're looking for, so whether you want just the single gene or if you want the fullest panel, um, and then also, you know, figuring out insurance and institutional um, associations with different laboratories um, also plays into those decisions. Um, so there's, there's still a few that do more of the testing. It's not all genetic testing labs that offer CDLS testing, um, but in the last few years, um, more of the larger genetic testing companies are starting to offer the full panel. Thank you, Sarah. Can you discuss about splice mutation? Our daughter, excuse me, splice mutation. Our daughter has that type, and they were specifically concerned about the mildness or the severity of that particular type of mutation. Sure. So there, as Lena had gone through, there are different types of mutations, and splice mutation can have affect the transcript and how the gene is really read. And depending on where exactly that mutation occurs can cause maybe more mild symptoms or more severe symptoms. It really kind of depends on the exact mutation. Um, and even with, and with CDLS, we do tend to find that children who have the same exact mutation can even present very differently. So individuals with the same type of mutation, exact same mutation in NIPBL or exact same mutation in SMC1 or any of the other genes, there we find that there can still even be some variability. So it is really hard to predict the exact outcome of a child. And a lot of times we say that your child really is going to be your best guide and you know them best and better than anyone else. You're with them all the time. And unfortunately we can't really predict what an outcome will be 10, 20 years down the road as we can't really predict with any child. Uh, but all we can go off of is what we've really seen before and kind of these general conclusions that have been made based off of what tends to cluster or occur more commonly with the different genes. But it's really hard to predict an outcome since there can be such variability. Thank you. Elena, do you know of uh, resources for funding that families can get for genetic testing if their insurance doesn't cover that? That's a great question. So there are some laboratories that um, are just their goal, part of their business plan is to really provide access as best as possible to patients. And so they have, they call various names, but like patient assistance programs where if you attempt to go through insurance and insurance either denies or doesn't fully cover the testing, then the laboratory might be able to provide some assistance and bring that cost down so the parents and the families aren't fully responsible for um, that genetic testing cost. Um, there are also some locations, so some places that are doing research uh, for CDLS that may have some grant funding uh, that would allow for clinical testing to be run as opposed to just the research testing because I know Sarah was talking a little bit about how research studies aren't always going to provide true test results um, to patients but there are there are times in which uh, funding can be gained from a grant for that clinical testing to a clinical lab um, and so speaking to individuals involved in research uh, may also be an option to look into funding um, I've also had some families just 
to work with their genetic counselor and genetics team to figure out where the kind of lowest possible out-of-pocket cost may be for them. And then they, you know, talk to family and friends and see if there's any um, way that as a group um, they can put together some funding to help with that coverage as well. Thank you. Um, Sarah, there's a parent that just asked um, if a child with mild CDLS, if there's a benefit or a consequence to introducing growth hormone. I wasn't sure if you were comfortable fielding that. Sure. So we do get that question a lot and we do refer families if you're interested in pursuing or even learning more about growth hormone treatment to meet with an endocrinologist. And we always say one of the first steps is to evaluate if there's a growth hormone deficiency. Because if there is a deficiency in a child's growth hormone, then we do know that most likely in putting growth hormone back to the child, which is done through injections right now, um, would likely give some benefit. The, we know with CDLS, children will be small, so even giving growth hormones to a child with CDLS who has a growth hormone deficiency, they will not be of typical or normal stature, but it can give some benefit. And sometimes we find that families feel that this may be more important for their boys versus their girls. Um, however, it's really more of a personal decision and we would encourage you to meet with endocrinology to at least first evaluate if there is a growth hormone deficiency. If there's not, it really depends on the treating endocrinologist. I've had experiences where some will still do a trial of growth hormone therapy to see if there is some benefit, whereas Others may advise against it. So it's really kind of up um, to you, the family, and you working with your endocrinologist to make sure you come up with a plan you're most comfortable with. Because even right now, growth hormones, still, since it is given through an injection, it can be pretty invasive and um, unpleasant to have for a child to have to go through that. I know that there are plans and there's some effort in trying to develop patches, but that's not available currently, and I'm not sure of exactly um, when that may become available. Thank you. Elena, um, we are actually down to our last two questions. Um, do you know numbers worldwide of children with SMC1A mutation? Hmm. That's a great question, and I actually don't know off the top of my head what those numbers might be. Um, it's something that we can definitely look into and follow up with um, following this webinar. Um, unless Sarah has anything else to add, I, I don't know that one off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't know the number exactly. And sometimes for us as clinicians, you know, all we can really go off of is what's reported in the medical literature. And we know that not every single child with an SNC1 change is reported. Um, but what we found is what has been reported in the literature is that about 5% of children with a CDLS diagnosis who have had genetic testing have a change in SNC1A. But as far as an exact number, I'm, I'm not sure. And we, we know which family poses questions, so we can follow up once you have that information for us. I'd be happy to relay that. Um, our last question, have all cheek swabs submitted at uh, prior CDLS conferences been tested yet? Sorry, so I believe I, that's to you, Sarah. <laughs> yes. Um, so that's a great question. I know a lot of families, they've contacted our group and contacted the foundation to ask about cheek swabs. And Unfortunately, not all of them have been screened yet. So as of right now, we've had 20 samples that have been screened. Um, out of those 20, we found two who've had a mosaic change. And what we've been doing is prioritizing families who've already had their child tested for the known CDLS genes using blood. Um, we unfortunately just have limited resources and we have some grant funding right now, but the grant funding that we've received was specific for sequencing blood samples on um, a subset of children. The, we're very interested in screening all the buckle swabs and we really would love to do that and that is our eventual goal. Um, but as of right now, we only have had about 20 that have been screened and if you're, we have notified those families, but if any family has a particular question about their child's status, certainly please reach out to me directly and I can look into that for you and give you an update. 
Thank you both for your great responses, and thanks to the audience for such thoughtful questions. And I am going to hand over the mic to Whitney now. All right. Well, thank you, Lynn. And so now that we're at the close of our webinar, um, I just want to say thank you to Sarah and Elena for taking time out of your very busy schedules to share such important information with not only our families, but the rest of the CDLS community that will be hopefully watching this while it's on our website as well. Um, I did want to let everybody know that we do have a handout available under the handouts tab to the right of your screen. And that is the article that um, covers um, a little bit more information about the genotype and phenotypes. So you can download that if that's something you'd like to read up on a little bit more than what was covered in the presentation. So again, thank you so much, Sarah and Elena, for being our, presentation, our presenters today. And thank you so much to all of the people in our audience. And thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next time.